already in a vivid discussion. I will just shortly tell you I'm an intensivist. I've been working on the ICU for many, many years, and I have come to use Anaconda, the anesthetic conserving device, when I first discovered it here, just here at the EasyCam 13 years ago. And ever since, I've been using Anaconda in different ICUs, and I just wanted to give you some of my experiences that I have. We're going to skip some of the slides because Peter has already uh, them in, inside. I just want to highlight the pioneers of uh, volatile anesthetics and use in the ICU, how we can put inhaled sedation and volatile anesthetics in the sedation context, and how we do it practically. So this is the almost first study we have with inhaled sedation in the ICU. It's from 1989. So the career of volatile anesthetics on, on the ICU is not a new one. It's not young, as to say, but we are very, very um, used to, to volatile anesthetics, especially I'm an anesthesiologist, and two-thirds of our ICUs in Germany are driven by anesthesiologists. So we are quite familiar to use it. The thing was that during the Time, we had these big anesthesia machines, we had to bring them from the OR to the ICU, and we had these problems. And although this uh, study showed that we can get rid of our sedation with short of time, which is 10 minutes, exactly what, what Peter was telling us, uh, compared to Maida Salam, it could not be used. Either you use the anesthesia machine or you use this vaporizer technique in the inspiratory limb. But this was a problem because you had the pollution inside your ICU and there were concerns not only from pollution but from the high consumption of volatile anesthetics. So it was with the turn of the Landium that for the first time we had a medical device, which is called the anesthetic conserving device, to give anesthetics on the ICU. And there were two small studies coming from Sweden to, to see how Anaconda is working. Actually, this was taken from the OR, where they had an idea how to use it. And then um, this is the device that Peter has shown us before. This is how we see our patients today on the ICU. So this is a neurosurgical ICU. I have been working uh, some years ago, and you can see the setup with the patient with a Y uh, piece here coming from the respirator. You have the anaconda in place where the HME filter is. We uh, use a lot of nebulization. That is never a contraindication for us uh, for use. We usually use a closed suctioning system, uh, which I can re recommend you because there, this is the only uh, time where we can have high concentration. And if we use suctioning, of course, we suction it out of the lung. This is different than nebulization. Usually we won't have any interference and we always do it in our patients. So this can be a setup. We use the VAMOS, but it depends on what you have on your ICU, what you use as a monitor for the gas concentration. And you can see here, this is a neurosurgical patient with the ECP here um, um, with a drainage that we put in. So we use it in neurosurgical patients as well. So you have seen this study before. It's from Peter Sake. This is what when I started in 2006, what I had in my hands. And I was, uh, during that period, uh, at cardiac surgery. So I was really keen on getting to know what's happening with a patient post-operative. And I had 75 patients. They were investigated either to receive propofol or sevoflurane in the post-operative period. And they were ventilated up to eight hours rewarmed and then wind from the ventilator and that was quite astonishing. I was in the beginning I did not have any idea of inhaled sedation in the ICU and I thought that SIVO would bring the same effect as propofol because pro propofol was always my standard and I thought well that's a good thing and it should be the same as uh, propofol but actually I found out it can be quite different in my patients and I had many many times I had this time slot here for propofol where the ventilator went to an apnea uh, alarm but they always felt like getting to sleep again with a propofol and I always had to recheck which is different in a sevoflurane patients. They can be extubated with, within 30 minutes and it's quite different. It can be programmed and this is what I learned actually and we saw which was astonishing and it's 
at the moment is the only study that these patients could be discharged from hospital much earlier than the other propofol group. So the, you have seen the slide before. This Mesnil was the one who took all the three sedatives together, the most used propofol and midazolam, and Peter already explained it to you. And uh, for me, it's always like, um, if I have a sedation and I have a concept in the ICU, I always have to look at the guidelines and how they can fit into my concept that I promote in the ICU. And we have this different type now. We are looking at uh, in our um, um, uh, ICU, we have assessor managed delirium, we have agitation and sedation. We have to know about the choice of our sedatives and what they promote. And then we have a pain and analgesia management as a basis. And we like to have early mobilization and even think about sleep disruption. So the guidelines say use proper fold X over benzodiazepines. And this is where I think isoferrine can come in because following these three commands, we, we have to see what can we do the best to our patient to help him out when he's intubated and help him out uh, with, with the context <coughs> of our PADIS guidelines. So the key might be why not use volatile anesthetics because we know about the profile of our patient. And this is the German guideline we have for sedation, analgesia and delirium. And I would just want to take out this part because it's just too much. It's, a, it's, it's really um, um, a picture of many, many things. But here it says indication of sedation. Light sedation seems to be key and king at the moment in, in Germany. Nevertheless, if you have a patient that you have to sedate, you have to choose first what kind of RAS, what your aim is of RAS, and what kind of... Um, of uh, uh, drugs you're going to use. And the guidelines, this one is the latest guideline from 2015. Already in 2010, we had an option and alternative here, volatile and analgesia. So they already in the guideline in Germany, although they still off label. So since 2010, we use them as an alternative sedation. And uh, um, this is how, how we, promote uh, volatile anesthetics in the ICU because uh, the guidelines clearly state use refrain, but please have a look at the, at the fluorides, like two, three days, and then you can change to isoflurane. And for isoflurane, it seems that there's a lot of data and we really don't be afraid or we don't have to be afraid of using isoflurane for even for long-term sedation. I use isoflurane in many, many patients for long-term sedation, if they, they suffer from sepsis, abdominal dressing therapy, they go back to the OR, they come again, then I know uh, in, in two days and we have to reopen the abdomen and I know I cannot extubate them. Um, then I always use isoflurane for these patients and sometimes I use it, I mean, like for weeks. For me, it's, it's quite... Yeah, easy to, to handle a sedation, and I can have light sedation as well. So if I have a patient, for example, here, um, as is a patient in prone position with hemodialysis, this is the way we choose our, um, our sedation uh, in these patients. And this is how the setup looks like with the VAMOS, the ventilator. Here we have the scavenging system, and you see it's quite easy here to, to put the HME filter and to use it. And we have, here we have as well our nebulization, and we have a closed suction system as well. As soon as the lung is resolved, this is why the lady is in prone position. You turn her around and then you can start like tapering down your sedation level. This is how we use it. 
And they had always been concerned about using uh, volatile anesthetics in the ICU, especially from the nurses. I don't know how your nurses will react when you start bringing the volatile anesthetics on your ICU. So uh, we had, when we started, we had to have a close look uh, at the environmental pollution. And we have to say that the limit concentration that had been recommanded, that is scarce uh, data on that. It was uh, a task force uh, round table statement when they said in the US, okay, we use two ppm as a limit for everything, but actually for Germany, you can see we have here, we don't have really recommendations, uh, only for halothane and enferine, which are no longer in the market, not uh, in Europe. And so you see here, we have not really restrictions, but we stick to the 2 ppm level. And there have been many, many studies now where we can see that when you use an ICU, you use um, um, inhaled sedation, there is not really a problem of environmental pollution and concerns about headaches or uh, any abortion with the pregnant women. There is not. But the thing is that we can highlight different parts here. And this is a study from Herzog Nisjeri. She's a lady from Bochum, from a university. She started very in detail when she can measure pollution in, uh, in her patient. And this is what she found out, that when you start positioning your patient, like putting him in a prone position, when the patient starts coughing uh, from the airway, when we do suctioning and filling the syringe, we can have a small peak that is never exceeding a 2 ppm level and it's very short time we we can just see it here so in general we have to say there is no pollution but there's always talk and concern and when you establish this on your ICU I just can um, give you um, the advice just tell people about it be open tell them what's happening and how your levels are and that usually with the normal air rate in your um, air turnover rate in your ICU, which is usually more than six, sometimes even 10 or 12. And with a um, scavenging system, there's no concern about it. So let me move to some other slides um, just to highlight a little bit of what's happening with inhaled sedation. Uh, we have this mortality study. It's the, the first uh, mortality study we have from Belgard, from University of, uh, of Bochum as well. He did a retrospective analysis uh, uh, over five years, collecting all those patients that were ventilated more than four days. And they were on really severe sepsis, all these patients with high Apache scores. And he divided them to an isoflurane group for sedation and an IV group. And what he actually found out that ho a ho a hospital discharge was uh, significantly higher in the isoflurane group, 60% compared to IV uh, sedation. And this goes even further. And he had a look at mortality. And you can see here this big range between the two groups. And if you have a look here, already a hospital mortality was more than 20% lower. And even one year mortality uh, was differing in 20%. So this is at the moment the only outcome study we have for mortality. Though it's retrospective, we have to see if there are other studies coming in the future where we can say there is something that is switching with the inhaled sedation. And you have seen this study before from Karnisch and colleagues from Charité in Berlin. And they, uh, this is how we use nowadays uh, inhaled sedation in many, many ICUs in Germany. People are resuscitated, they come to the emergency department and they need a cooling. They need a target control, temperature uh, management. And our experience was in the beginning that they always start like shivering, they need deep sedation, and we have the problem that we start with propofol, we go for midazolam, then we use clonidine, in the end we do a muscle relaxation, which is uh, not very common, common use in Germany. So many, many ICUs nowadays, they use it, uh, this inhaled sedation, to have 
in these 24 hours of, uh, of low temperature management to use it, and they have really a good experience in doing it. And what they saw is this difference in four days of ventilation time, ventilation time, which is really huge. I mean, having a patient being resuscitated and then extubated and four days earlier than the others is quite a big thing to see. And uh, um, here, um, ICU stay, of course, was uh, as well four, day, four days um, earlier. So this is quite interesting to see what's happening at the moment. And then you have seen my slide from the neurological, uh, neurosurgical uh, ward. And uh, of course, we have some concern when we use isoflurane, especially because it has been proposed that isoflurane influences the ECP, the intracranial pressure. And this is one study from... Um, from a Spanish group where they had a close look what's happening in their patients. If they come from propofol, uh, then go like one hour to isoflurane and back to propofol. And actually 15 patients included the severe hemorrhage. And you can see what's happening. A regional uh, cerebral blood flow is going up, but at the same time, the intracranial pressure is staying. And the experience we had on the, on the ward was either when you set them on isoferrin, nothing happens, or you will have really some, some it's a very small portion of patients where the ECP is going up, but it might go up as well with IV sedation, and we then stop in this case inhaled sedation, but the, the, the percentage is very, very low. So just have a look at your patient, how he is reacting. When you use it in neurosurgery, you should have any kind of monitoring of the ECP, otherwise it's something you're swimming in, in, in the open ocean. You don't know where you're going, actually. So uh, I could just advise you, use, use your ECP and have a look at the patient. But it's not that you cannot use it. We used it in many, many of these patients because we wanted to have a daily wake-up in those patients to have a neurological monitoring. And this was, for us, it was very convincing. And um, it was in Karlsruhe when we used this. So where are we now today with inhaled sedation? You have seen some of these slides before. This is a topic with, I will not go into detail because we have seen these before. Uh, that is all the data in animals and even in humans where it was found that we have a modulation of inflammation of sepsis uh, that we seem to to do the best thing to our patient when we we have ARDS lung injury how you for example treat your patients on the ICU so this is all together all the studies we had from Jabondon where we know that we modulate oxygenation index and this is how I use on my ICU inhaled sedation and it's quite convincing even if you have them in rotating beds and you have so many RV lines it's an extra alternative line it's not IV it's inhaled sedation it makes you a little bit freer to, to have uh, modulation even uh, for the therapy of IV uh, drugs and this goes even further. It's all those who use ECMO as well, they use it with inhaled sedation. This is coming from Andreas Meiser. He used to be in Bochum, then went to Hamburg, and he's very um, yeah, engaged in using um, volatile anesthetics. And he uses them in, uh, in ECMO patients as well. And he says... So this was only a small series of six patients, but he says they had deep sedation in the beginning with all the lines. He only had to use one to three ml per hour, which is the consumption and the syringe pump rate. But he had a lot of spontaneous breathing and early winging. And this is my experience as well. And we have to show it from from other studies that spontaneous breathing is something that comes with inhaled sedation, which is, uh, which is much lower with IV sedation, that already during the acute phase of lung disease, we can have spontaneous breathing. It's not that you need really 
a protocol to put them on, on spontaneous breathing, but it comes with it and you use it in your patients. And we have already heard that, I will just skip this, that um, uh, inhaled sedation is not reserved to adults, but we can use it in children as well. And there is, Peter Sake was the first who, to show us how it could work. It was still the, the big anaconda, the 100 ml anaconda he put here in line in the inspiratory limb. So as this is a child, we have uh, low rates here um, for, for, for this um, boy being treated. This is one possibility we can have, but now with a, with a 50 ml anaconda, a 20 kilogram boy can be treated easily with a 50 ml because we don't have to care about the death space, which has changed a lot from, from the use. But there are others they are using in Germany, they're using inhaled sedation. So this is a study group of um, Dr. Eifinger from University of Cologne, and he is concerned about the very small gestation aged babies. So they come with two or three kilograms. They're just like 23rd week of gestation age. And he has these big problems with sedation. And he said, when I look at my um, small babies, I have the problem, I start with mitosolam, then I go for morphine or fentanyl. Sometimes I even go for amifentanyl if I don't have the chance to ventilate them. Then I have clonidine, ketamine, and even using GABA, Samsonit, uh, we, we have in Germany. And then he said, suddenly, I have to find something new because this is a difficult and complex sedation in, in these children. And he said, I will now use isoprenin and see what's happening. You can see here the setup for these babies. The setup is that you put the anaconda in the inspiratory limb. Okay, just directly at the ventilator, which can be uh, here as well, yeah, but you can put it here directly to the ventilator. I give the gas in the inspiratory limb, and as the babies are quite small, my consumption will be 9 to 10 ml, but it's working very well. And what he's describing comes here that uh, the babies start breathing more frequently spontaneously that they saw a reduction of analgesic and co-sedatives. They could get rid of all the other sedatives. And he said that this is really an option for him to have uh, these um, difficult uh, children on the ICU and sedate them. So to come to the end is uh, to say that Already nowadays, inhaled sedation forms part of our guidelines. We have integrated them for more than nine years. We're coming to our 10th year of inhaled sedation, which is quite comfortable. We know that we use trucks in the sedation context that are short acting. We have early spontaneous breathing, shorter extubation and ventilation time. Uh, we have to look in the future, and it seems so that we have shorter lengths of stay in the ICU, and perhaps we can modulate uh, mortality. And you have heard from our discussion here with Peter that we have additional options now in lung injury in children, and indication if we become wider. For me, it's always like uh, I'm so much used to volatile anesthetics that I have to find a reason why not to use it. This is how I use volatile anesthetics in the ICU. Yes, and then we can open the discussion.